Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is Roger Royce. I'm the founder of the Royce Law Firm, a business tax and corporate law firm with offices in Northern and Southern California. Today's webinar is on the new paradigm of law practice. And we've assemble, assembled a panel of experts here on the latest cutting edge technologies and developments in the legal practice business model. I think I noticed that we have quite a few attendees here today who are actually lawyers, and you probably noticed that the practice of law is in a state of dramatic change. We've got new technologies emerging almost every day, making legal services more efficient and less expensive. Consumers have access to lawyers instantly with web-based legal portals, crowdsourcing. Uh, there's even online settlement dispute uh, solutions available. Our panelists are going to discuss these new models and are going to provide their insights on how to integrate this into this new legal paradigm. I'm going to moderate this panel. We are going to have five speakers, including plus myself. Uh, I, the way we typically run our weekly webinars is everybody has an opportunity to introduce themselves, describe what it is that they want to get across, what they bring to this discussion, and then we launch right into questions. You'll notice on your uh, dialog box on your webinar that there is a place for comments and questions. We'll collect those questions and comments and we'll put them to the panelists at the end if we have time. Uh, the webinar will run for one hour. We expect uh, to conclude uh, at uh, no later than 12 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard. The webinar will be recorded. You'll find it on RoyceUniversity.com as well as YouTube and uh, uh, as a download in the iTunes store as a podcast. Uh, the slides will also be available uh, on Royce University and from the participants. Our panel today will consist of uh, Renee Kanaki. She's a, an associate professor of law at Michigan State University College of Law and a co-founder of the reInvent Law Laboratory. Uh, Richard Granite is chair of the e-lawyering task force of the American Bar Association's Law Practice Management Section and a founder and CEO of Direct Law. Raj Abiyankar is Chief Executive Officer of Legal Force. Bo Sartain, founder of VentureDocs, and Lisa Honey, the product manager at Rocket Lawyer. And I'm your moderator, I'm Roger Royce. Next slide, please. So a few years ago, it occurred to me that we were having this change in the way legal services are being delivered and a change in what consumers expected consumers of legal, legal services expect it, and the fact that they're becoming much more web-based and, and technology-oriented. And our law firm implemented a legal wizard powered by iDurus. And our legal wizard, that's the facing page, uh, was a way for our clients to actually go into a form system and download documents and forms themselves. And the concept that we applied was that for selected clients, they could actually access a standard form, they could fill it out themselves, and then an attorney would actually review that before releasing it to the client. So they would get attorney review, but we took a lot of uh, what we thought was the inefficiency out of the model. Uh, for some clients, it worked really well. For other clients, it didn't work so well. What we found in this practice is that some people uh, were really good uh, at completing their own NDAs. Uh, for other people, it didn't work so well. They weren't that great at it. But for the ones that actually got into the system and were very tech savvy and used it, it turned out to be a very good model. Next slide, please. So we have moved from that to, um, and this is the facing page of our legal wizard. People would actually sign in. Uh, they'd have a password and they'd have, had, they'd have access to all the documents that they created, we reviewed, and that they stored online and they, uh, uh, in a directory system. Next slide, please. So, yeah, and there's another. Uh, Here's a, a look at uh, a screenshot of some of the uh, documents that clients were able to create and save on our, our, uh, on our shared portals. So next slide. So where we actually move from that is something that we're going to be introducing here pretty quickly, which is a legal wizard that goes one step beyond that. Rather than a client going in and, and trying real hard uh, to fill in all the right blanks and create a form that sometimes you know, was right and sometimes had to be rewritten, we've got a set of questionnaires now 
So it's very much like in the real world where somebody might fill out an incorporation questionnaire. Uh, our system is that a client could fill out a set of questions uh, on online, which will be turned into a set of corporate documents uh, that actually has legal review. And I think, uh, next slide please, and it seems to me that that is very much where at least the legal product of incorporation is moving to. I'm not sure anybody views that as really a high margin business anymore. It seems to me that it's very much a commodity uh, and something that people are going out and doing by themselves anyway because they can get documents so easily online. And our view is that there really ought to be some attorney oversight in that. And that's what we're trying to provide to that process. Other side. So I just want to introduce that as sort of our uh, entry into this emerging growth area and our foray into the market and, and one of the solutions that we're using. Uh, in addition, uh, keep in mind that we do keep this, you know, there's the, the uh, login information for our legal wizard through iJurus. Uh, we also have resource sites on Rice University um, and a um, relationship site on Rice Link. So that's an attorney's perspective of it and that's my experience with uh, uh, trying some of these new technologies. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Renee uh, for a description of what you folks do at the reInvent Law Laboratory. Okay, pass the screen, Yvonne. Renee? Say, Renee, can you unmute your phone? I'm sorry, Renee, you're going to have to unmute your phone. We can't hear you. I'll tell you what, we're going to come back to Renee. We seem to be having troubles with her. Richard? Uh, Richard. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Richard Granite, and uh, as Roger said, I'm co-chair of the e uh, Task Force for the ABA Law Practice Management section, but I also run a company called Direct Law. And... Uh, We've been working really through the C-Learning Task Force for the last 10 years to help lawyers understand that the platform for the delivery of legal services is really changing from one-to-one -one in the office to the internet itself as a platform and as a means of actually delivering legal services. And what that really means is that we believe that uh, within a relatively short period of time, in the next three or four years, every law firm will need to have some form of a secure client portal of the kind that Roger just showed you. And um, the, the, the access to the client portal is really through the website. So rather than have just a passive website which just has information about who you are and some content, uh, a client will actually be able to sign in and do things with their lawyer. We define e-lawyering as uh, things that uh, lawyers do, except they're doing it online rather than offline. And with new applications coming into play like uh, document automation and expert systems, the platform for delivering those kinds of uh, applications are really, uh, uh, has to really be the web itself. Uh, one of the, the, the data uh, points that, that actually concerns me is that only about 60% of solos even have a website. So if you don't have a website, you can't deliver legal services online because the gateway to, to legal services is really the website itself through which a uh, a user logs on. So to give you an example, uh, uh, our direct law, and I don't, I don't want this to be a pitch, but I think it's a good uh, way of really describing how this works. What we do is bundle essentially a virtual law firm in a box that can plug into your existing website, which provides a number of different services, including libraries of automated documents so that a client can, just like in LegalZoom, and as Roger just showed you, fill out an online questionnaire which immediately generates a document ready for the lawyer's review, further advice, and further uh, revision. 
Um, uh, so we call that really a support platform for delivering what we call unbundled legal services for a fixed fee, which is what we really know that clients want today, or at least uh, for uh, simpler transactions uh, which they uh, can participate themselves in some form of a self-help mode. My own law firm is MD Family Lawyer, which was the first, probably one of the first uh, virtual law firms in the United States, which I st started in 2003 out of Maryland which actually focuses on family law. Um, a good way of actually seeing how these concepts work is just go to direct law and you can see in a free trial what a client sees and what the attorney dashboard is uh, and how it works in terms of managing all the kinds of functions for delivering legal advice online, for assembling documents online, for enabling a client to pay their bills online, for storing documents online. And I, uh, in addition, what we've done is Put together. Um, put me back in. Yeah. What? Hi. I, I, Renee, you back in? Uh, after Richard goes. Yeah. Okay. Let me just finish up. So, uh, um, the, the difference between uh, a program like Direct Law and other kinds of web-enabled practice management solutions is that it creates what we call a client-facing environment. It's uh, an environment in which uh, the client can actually do things with their lawyer online, uh, not dissimilar to what uh, Roger just showed you. Um, but uh, we're packaging this in a way so the technology is really accessible and affordable. And uh, I, uh, I see that if lawyers don't move into this space, the ones that don't move into this space will actually be less competitive because we know that we have a younger generation that's coming up which will have legal problems, which has the internet in their DNA, and uh, they will simply want to deal with you online. They want the, the efficiency, the speed, and the immediacy of an online connection. And if you don't have an online connection, you're simply not going to be competitive in the future. So with that said, <clears throat> let me now turn this back over to Renee. Renee, you ready? Thank you, Richard. Yes, Renee, you, uh, I, I think okay. I am back with you now. Hopefully both my slides and me. So sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened, but here we go. Okay, um, okay go ahead. Wonderful. All we'll right. Take a minute to get the slides up. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we can all appreciate the irony of, of having technology problems on a webinar on technology solutions. All right. But, Hopefully uh, you have my slides and me. Yes. Fantastic. Yep. Excellent. All right. Yes. Thanks for uh, bearing with that. So I guess it's appropriate that I'm going to be talking a little bit about lawyers and entrepreneurship because we can still use lots of um, developments in technology in this space. Uh, anyway, um, as Roger said in uh, the introduction, I'm Renee Kanaki. I'm a professor at Michigan State University College of Law and also co-founder of Reinvent Law, which is a law laboratory uh, that we launched uh, about a year ago. And the reason why we did that is because we really felt it was important to start thinking about technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship in legal services. And uh, we thought this was a space that, in particular, the legal academy uh, hadn't really filled fully. And we thought there were lots of gaps, even amongst those lawyer entrepreneurs, some of whom are on this very panel, uh, that we thought we might be able to uh, both help uh, enhance work that's happening in the space and also perhaps begin training the next generation of lawyers who would be part of it. And so that was the motivation for creating the Law Laboratory. We have what we call our four pillars of innovation in legal services. They are law, technology, design, and delivery. And here's uh, what I mean by this. We believe it's not enough to be experts in the law anymore. Uh, every lawyer needs to be thinking about how to use technology coupled with principles of design and the user's experience in the way they deliver legal services. And we aim to help lawyers and also our law students get that extra training they need in technology design and delivery. And so we very much see ourselves um, to borrow the innovation that happened uh, in computer and technology in Silicon Valley. We see ourselves as the garage, if you will, for inventing legal services, tools, and models. Um, and so let me say a few things about how, how that, that actually happens on the ground for us. 
Uh, we, again, focus on training and technology, data analytics, design principles, entrepreneurship, and beyond. This includes courses that students can take at Michigan State, like entrepreneurial lawyering, virtual law practice, quantitative methods for lawyers, e-discovery. We also run a program in London that's open to any law students and practicing lawyers. We have um, a number of practicing lawyers who will be joining us this June for it. And that program focuses on the regulation of the legal profession, the way the profession has been uh, liberalized in the United Kingdom, new models and markets for delivering legal services, and also legal information engineering, which we believe is an important new space for lawyers to be thinking about. Uh, and uh, we, as we see, say that math will be on the exam. So it's also understanding that lawyers need to uh, have that quantitative background uh, as they approach and think about the way they run their legal practice. We also function as an R&D department, if you will, for law firms and house counsel and legal startups. And so the kinds of things we're doing in that space, I can just share a few of them with you. Uh, we are both inventing our own ways of thinking about the law differently and also helping others. So two of the things that we've created in our laboratory space, one is the Legal Language Explorer, which you can see up in the upper right-hand corner. It's a visualization of the language used in Supreme Court and Court of Appeals cases. Uh, My Laws is a beautiful, easy-to-use website to navigate the Michigan Compiled Laws. This is our first version of it. In, in the uh, next version, it will include mapping and visualization, so sort of like when you see the red dot on Google Maps when you're looking for a place to get coffee, a legislator who wants to propose a change will be able to see on a map of the statutes all of the other statutes where uh, uh, that might be impacted by that legislative change, or if the individual wants to find every piece of the Michigan Code that regulates the issue they're concerned with of mapping. And then the other visual piece uh, that we are adding to our code is uh, video, and so that you can actually see the behavior or the issue that is regulated and depicted. Those are a couple examples of things that we're building in the lab. We also partner with others to do beta testing of new kinds of uh, legal services products. We do market research. We do development. Those are just a few examples. We really are focused on trying to create a new ecosystem in both legal education and also law practice, one that we call law entrepreneurship. And it's the idea that lawyers in the future um, will not just advise entrepreneurs, but lawyers will be entrepreneurs. And uh, you have some fantastic examples of lawyers who are entrepreneurs on this very panel today. Uh, so it's really a, a, a thrill for me to be part of it. We are doing this uh, also, the last piece that I'll just mention, um, is that we are, we're doing this in a way that we want to solve problems, imagine broadly about how legal services can be delivered to markets that maybe haven't reached them, uh, received them in the past, and we're trying to create a community. And so and the, the other piece uh, of our lab work is in hosting events. We started in London last year trying to generate a conversation. We went to Dubai uh, in December, uh, Silicon Valley most recently. Um, some of the folks on the phone uh, or on the webinar uh, were part of that, and perhaps some of you who are uh, in our audience as well. And at all of these events will be in uh, London this June. We are trying to advance the conversation on law, innovation, entrepreneurship, thinking about technology tools. And for those of you who haven't been able to be part of the event, all of this is available on our reInvent Law channel, um, reinventlawchannel.com. And here, what we really were trying to do is, again, fill a gap. We, we thought that there were some interesting spaces if you wanted to be thinking innovatively, big ideas in other fields. Um, TED Talks fo focus on all sorts of fields, but nothing with a particular emphasis on what is happening in law. And we felt it was important to create a space for that, and then also to have these talks available for lawyers who are wanting to educate themselves about what's happening, and also for educators, legal educators, who want to bring these speakers into their classrooms, and so um, that's part of our effort as well. The last thing I'll mention is that we uh, launched a startup competition where we are encouraging our students to think about legal problems and propose uh, tools as entrepreneurs 
to solve them, and uh, so uh, we are hoping to really create the next generation of, of entrepreneurs, if you will. Uh, you can read more about this at our website. We have a poem uh, about our, uh, our focus and our energy in, in really thinking about how legal services can be delivered in new ways. And so that's a snapshot of what we do, and uh, I'll look forward to being able to talk more uh, specifically about our work in law and entrepreneurship in the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Renee. Poetry and law. So uh, Raj Apiyankar is the CEO of Legal Force. He's also the founder of uh, the uh, firm Trademarkia that you may be available with. Raj, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Royce, for putting this um, wonderful uh, webinar on. I'm always impressed by you and your firm and your innovativeness in, in doing these webinars, and it's good for, for clients and the public. And So thank you for inviting me first. Um, so I'm not exa exactly sure what you want me to talk about. Um, well, I'm Raj Abiyankar. We have a, a, you know, a patent and trademark primarily law firm that we've uh, we started, at, similar to Voices, it's, this firm has grown a, a lot in the last few years because we created a website called Trademarkia, which has become kind of the de facto um, uh, go-daddy of trademarks. People search for a name, logo, and slogan, and if it's available, they apply for their brand all over the world. So if someone's starting a new business and the new business is called, um, you know, uh, uh, say, chair, um, this was something else. It's, it's flower, um, flower um, chair, you know, flower chai. And if, if if it's available, people can apply for it all over the world. People can click, you know, which countries they want to apply for a trademark for. When they start the process, they become clients of our law firm. If it were taken in any one of 16 countries, it would let you know we have our own database we've built of all the trademarks. People can sign in with Facebook, and essentially they become clients of our of our law firm. Uh, by signing a terms and conditions when they go through the workflow. Taking government data, we've also created the world's largest logo search engine. So if people wanted to see a logo with a dog in it, you know, this is not a logo that actually um, is a name dog, but actually has a dog in it. Um, you know, people can search that and find all the logos that have a particular element inside of it. So here's all the logos that have dog in it uh, of some kind. or if you wanted to expand that out, it's got lions. This is all the same classification that are provided by the USPTO. If I didn't find all logos that have a panda bear in it, these are all logos that have a panda bear in it. People can see dead logos that have a panda bear in it. And basically, dead means they're abandoned by the USPTO by the client. So by someone across history over 150 years. So if someone wanted to start a new you know, company using this logo, uh, assuming the copyright issues can be understood or have been abandoned, um, you know, someone can reapply for a trademark around a, a logo that's been abandoned over the years and ages. Um, and so it kind of helps people rekindle new brands. So we've created a consumer-centric search engine, essentially, for our law firm, which has kind of allowed our, our law firm to grow very fast. Um, you know, our, it, it doesn't say, you know, hire us or anything. It's just a place where people go and search for government data. And through playing with our website, they essentially become clients of our firm. It's also a ratings and review site. So, you know, just like Yelp, people rate and review thousands of things on our website every single month. And you know, it, it's it, instead of rating businesses, you're rating products and services or and businesses. A lot of times that may have been abandoned 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So we've become a kind of a ratings and reviews type of site too. So we've kind of made government data fun and interesting in innovative uh, ways by just taking existing stuff that government already publishes. So instead of doing blogs, we've just taken, you know, we've hired our own development team and we've built uh, consumer-centric experiences using uh, raw government data. And what that's done to us is it's made our firm go from 50 clients to uh, having 24,000 clients, we're adding 500 clients every month. It's more like 25,000 clients at this point. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a deeper way to uh, uh, have uh, these clients work with a real life attorney. And uh, you know, we're specialists in patents and trademarks. We're not specialists in corporate law like Royce is. Uh, we're not specialists in immigration or other areas of law. 
So what we need is we need to create a network of attorneys that kind of share um, our clients with us in a way. And who, suppose you're in Dallas, Texas, you know, and we may have, you know, a few hundred clients in Dallas, Texas. We need a legal force branded firm so our clients feel like, even though it's an independent firm, it's part of the same family to help manage those clients. So one of the features that we are working on that's not quite uh, ready yet for, for prime time is going to allow a new tab to appear on Legal Force. You'll see, see this. I'm giving you a preview probably uh, in June. And it'll have a tab which will say Attorneys. And it'll be somewhere here. Or this will be reoriented somewhere. And when people click that Attorneys tab, people will be able to see uh, attorneys that not only work for our firm, but maybe other firms that are in our network attorneys around them and people right on our media property which legal force trademark and now drives two million unique visitors a month people will be able to compare and shop flat fee services with lots of different attorneys every attorney will have their own login and they'll be able to log in and kind of update their flat fee services on the fly and these services will be tied to our same shopping cart so people will be able to use PayPal checkout Google checkout whatever they want to hire those attorneys monies will go into an IOLTA trust account and essentially they'll be co-counsel clients with our primary firm. So uh, we've now got you know about 50, 60 attorneys that are ready to join this network. We're also exploring a partnership where, or even an investment from, from Thomson Reuters where it'll become uh, part of the Thomson Reuters fine law. Advertisers will have an opportunity to to, to be listed on the legal force uh, search engine for local clients in their area, plus market to our local clients. So all of a sudden, if you're qualified in the legal force network, uh, you'll be able to communicate with our clients who are in your geo geographic area. And essentially, um, you know, we're using this platform to build clients. Now we need a way to build deeper relationships with um, with clients through a network of attorneys. Um, and so that's kind of what we're moving towards now. Uh, we also have a partnership with Direct Law, which uh, you know hopefully uh, will start bearing fruit uh, uh, soon, where uh, some of the Direct Law subscribers and Richard Granitz will have access to be in the Legal Force Network. They're going to have to agree to so if you wanted to, if you're an attorney in private practice, you're going to have to agree to a certain standard that we expect for attorneys. Particularly, we want our attorneys that are on our network to respond to client requests within minutes, not even hours or days, but preferably minutes on most issues uh, every day, and at most within hours, and at late, latest within a day. And because clients expect that, in the day and age of mobile phones and, and, and tablets, people and clients expect responses very quickly. And even if the response is, look, I need to research something and get back to you, or my assistant will get back to you, or we'll need to figure this out, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. That's OK, but clients expect that response and engage the quality of an attorney by how responsive they are. So we want our attorneys to be very responsive. We want um, the the uh, uh, you know attorneys in our uh, network to be leveraging some of the skills we've built from our globalization skills to our to our um, internet automation skills and our SEM marketing skills, and more uh, recently our new physical retail space that we are uh, starting to pilot. We've just opened up this place, which is a physical store in downtown Palo Alto in front of the Apple Store on University Avenue where there are meeting rooms, there are uh, conference rooms that attorneys in our network will be able to use to meet clients. We've, we've had probably, you know, uh, through the space over a few hundred people in the last couple of months that have inquired about substantive legal issues or have, been, have retained a lawyer that's in our firm or that we've referred away. And we want to expand that to a network of attorneys that will share both our brand and our physical space. We're also in the process of uh, taking a building in Cupertino. Uh, hopefully by August, it's going to become it's a 10,000 square foot building. It's going to be like a Regis-like building, except it's full of lawyers and it's going to say legal force. And lawyers in private practice, whether they're solos or small firms, will be able to instead of leasing at Regis, they'll be able to lease at a legal force building, and it'll be a Class A space. And in there, everything we've branded legal force to so have centralized administrative support, centralized paralegal support, access to our, 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 our clients as well as access to our shared clients, especially, and access to uh, conference facilities as well as our globalized back-end support teams in India, 
and our technology teams doing paid search in in, uh, in the U.S. So we have um, you know plans for that type of expansion. Um, there are a lot of legal issues. I don't know you know I didn't know exactly what the interest level from the audience is and what I'm talking about and if they're more lawyers and not lawyers. So I think there are you know, lawyers on this call. So I've also prepared this presentation. This is the same presentation I just recently gave at the Stanford Law School asking about the ethical issues that we face um, and how we've dealt with those ethical issues um, and how, how they've affected our business. And I don't know how much time everyone has or whether you have any interest in going through this or not. So until I, before I do that, I guess I'll just let Royce decide whether I should or not. Okay, or yeah. Attend well, thank you, Raj. Time. We may be able to come back to that. Uh, <clears throat> really, uh, really amazing what you're doing. Uh, Bo, Bo Sartain is the founder of VentureDocs, one of the uh, recent entries into this market with respect to documents. Uh, Bo, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and VentureDocs? Absolutely, Roger. Thank you, and, and greetings to everyone. Uh, so my name is Bo Sartain. I'm the founder and CEO of VentureDocs, uh, and I am also a corporate securities attorney, and my practice for the last 15 years has focused on the emerging company venture capital practice. So uh, Venture Docs, in a nutshell, is a legal document assembly software company. So we use software to prepare the first draft of legal documents. And the analogy that I like to use is I say, look, we, we are to drafting what Westlaw is to research. And 20 years ago when I was in law school, I learned how to do legal research by going to the library and pulling books and pulling pocket parts. And it was a manual process that was very time consuming. Well, now all of that's automated. And I like to, to say to the attorneys as well, you know, Westlaw did not kill your legal practice. What it did was it allowed attorneys to be more efficient and therefore they could charge more and service more clients. And our objective is to do the same thing with legal document drafting. So the, the problem that we look at and that we're solving is one that is still manual labor. And I like to say that, that this method of, of document preparation is still prevalent and, and the vast majority of the attorneys that are preparing documents still do so by hand. Some of them are using two monitors and they're cutting and pasting and so they're a little more efficient than, than literally using pen and paper. But uh, uh, it is still a manual process. It is an ugly process. Um, it is prone to mistakes. Whoops. It is, it is prone to mistakes, and probably most importantly, um, it is just too time consuming and with a billable rate, uh, billable hour model, um, what, what is happening is there's, there's an increasingly a disconnect between the objective of the lawyer to, who wants to maximize profits and bill more hours and the client that wants to keep the cost under control and build in some certainty into the model. Um, I mentioned before that my background is with the emerging company venture capital style of legal practice. This is a quote from Fred Wilson uh, on ABC. ABC is the number one venture capital blog and the article that he wrote, he said, look, we did a simple incorporation and we did a, a seed financing preferred stock transaction with no negotiation and the cost was $17,000 in legal fees. And he said, okay, lawyers, you've got to do better. We have to get this down to $5,000. Uh, so as Roger mentioned before, um, in the early stage startup company practice, it's becoming more and more commoditized. And so this is what the market is demanding. Um, our solution to this is software as a service company. So VentureDocs is online. It is it is open, it is available, and it is a process by which the user, uh, similar to what Roger said on his site and, and similar to what Rich has, uh, the user completes a questionnaire providing data. We take those data, we generate very customized documents, and we offer them up to the user in a preview fashion. And the preview lets the user um, read every word of every document if that is what he or she desires. And so there is no mystery. Our users know what they're going to get. And if they choose to, they can pay and download the documents as Microsoft Word files. Uh, in terms of, of what we offer 
I like to think of uh, Venture Docs as covering the period for startups from inception through Series A. And, and that is, I think, where that is the pain point that we wanted to address. The startups do not have a lot of money to pay lawyers. They still need good legal advice. They still need good documents. They need to build that legal foundation that is going to allow them to go and raise money and eventually sell their business. Um, but there's a there's a, a, a pain point on the pricing. And the pain point goes both ways. The lawyers who engage in this space generally know they're not going to make money on the startups. Um, the, the, the center column and the column on the right of the chart here, really I think what that is to illustrate is, is our value proposition, which is you know we, we are trying to reduce the cost of document preparation by roughly an order of magnitude. I apologize for what's happening on my screen. Um, and so we're, we're trying to uh, make this entire process much more efficient. Um, we, we are a content company. We deliver documents. And so I think it's important to say something about the documents that we have chosen to automate. Um, so in terms of the documents that we automate, we uh, did not make these documents up. What I did was went out and looked for the best open source documents that I could find. And I found documents published by Techstars, by Y Combinator, by Founder Institute. So these, this set of documents with Founder Institute and Y Combinator, those are Wilson Sonsini prepared forms that were made open source. You can go download them. You can download them from our site or from those sites. Uh, and for Techstars, those were documents that were prepared and made open source by Cooley. So the documents that are underpinning our system uh, for the emerging company venture capital practice are documents that are already uh, vetted and they're already v widely in use. And so our service is to customize those documents for the particulars of their need and produce documents that in many cases are ready to sign right out of the box. Um, for the attorneys, um, I like to think of the corporate practice as, as a sales funnel. And attorneys engage in startups not because they want to engage in startups. Uh, it is very difficult to make money representing startups. But attorneys engage with startups in order to get to the good stuff. And the good stuff is, is, is having companies that are funded that are growing and they have many, many legal needs and they're funded so they can pay the attorneys their rates. Uh, so the inverse funnel is the revenue. There are lots of startups, but there's no, there's no real money to be made there. Whereas the companies, as the companies shake out and go down this corporate law sales funnel, uh, there, that's when there is money to be made. So we play at the top of the funnel, and we help the attorneys open up that funnel by being much more efficient, um, and then focus their time more on the the clients that are paying them money. In terms of the, the, the landscape of, of we, what we see is happening is um, a lot of the big firms are either automated, they're automating, they're under construction, or they're thinking about automation and they're talking to various vendors about automation and productivity tools. Um, and so the landscape is changing and what what VentureDocs is, by being software as a service, is you know, we're, we're attempting to level the playing field. And you know, by doing so where the, the firms that are automating or automated, it, it's what you might expect. It's the very, very large law firms that have that kind of a, an IT budget. Um, smaller firms, solo firms, there is, there's really no way that I can see them uh, uh, automating their documents and building the type of systems that Wilson Sonsini or Oric has. Um, they simply don't have the, the capital budget to do that. Roger, congratulations to you for what you've done. Um, so what we think we can do, and this is our, our product market fit, is probably with solos and smaller firms to level the playing field and give those types of lawyers really the same arsenal of automated tools that, that a Wilson Sonsini might have, but that is internal and proprietary to that law firm. Uh, I leave you with that. Uh, there is a 
statement at the bottom, excuse me, there's a statement at the bottom uh, that says we're not a substitute for the advice of an attorney. Uh, this is a required statement that is on our, our website. It is also true, and we believe it. Um, our goal is not to replace the attorney or to be a substitute for the attorney, but to provide clients and attorneys the tools to get effective legal advice and and spend their money on getting the advice they need, which is the ultimate value a lawyer brings is, is judgment and experience. And so um, that's where companies need to be spending their money, not on pushing commas. And that's what we handle. We handle pushing the commas. So that's, that's all I have. Okay, thanks very much, Bill. Very impressive. Lisa Honey, product manager at Rocket Lawyer. By the way, I love the name Rocket Lawyer. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what Rocket Lawyer is doing? We have Lisa? Yes, Roger, thank you. Um, hi, like Roger said, my name is Lisa Honey, and um, I am working on the product team here at Rocket Lawyer. And I guess sort of my main focus, though, is being head of the legal document operation at the company. In my not-so-distant past, I was actually a litigation attorney. I practiced in California, I practiced in Texas, and I practiced in Arkansas both large and small firms. And one thing that I noticed across the board, and we spoke, touched on this today, is that clients are wanting to be more and more involved in their cases. They want instant access to information, and they want to be educated about what's going on. And attorneys, I see this more and more, they're striving to provide that fast feedback. They want simple solutions for their clients and online access to their services and their expertise. So Rocket Lawyer is trying to help meet those needs. What we really specialize in is working with small businesses and consumers, and we're growing at a really fast pace. In fact, recently we were named the number 72 fastest growing private company on the um, US, on the Inc. 5000 list, and number five for software. And our founder, Charlie Moore, is also an attorney, and you know he started this company to make access to the law affordable and simple. And to do that, our platform combines online interview-driven documents, and free legal information through help articles and blogs with attorney services. And those attorney services are Q&A, that's a, a fairly recent, recent addition to Rocket Lawyer. We have consultations and then also representation by local attorneys at special rates for our members. We were founded in 2008 and since then we've grown to a company of 200 people with three offices in two continents. We serve roughly 3 million people each month and we have a network of close to 500 attorneys from the U.S. and the United Kingdom. So when we entered the market, there were already really great do-it-yourself solutions, and some of these are still out there today, and we've talked about some of them already during this webinar. But we wanted to take just a different approach and be a service that sort of goes beyond do-it-yourself. We recognize the importance of working with an attorney when you have a legal matter, and that attorneys can't be replaced. So our focus is more on a do-it-with-me concept. And this allows us to provide our customers with access not only to information and the documents that they create through this interview on our website, through our incorporation services as well, but also to licensed attorneys and counselors who will really guide them through their legal matter um, when they need that extra help. The attorneys in our network, they're answering questions quickly through our online platform. They're reviewing the documents that our users have created through these um, interviews on our website, and they're providing consultations, and they're also gaining clients that um, we're connecting through our site. So what we're doing, and really striving for, is to use technology to empower attorney, attorneys along with consumers. And I think it's a real testament to the attorneys in our network, because they're not just surviving, they're really, truly innovating, and their priority is being accessible to their consumers who become their clients really want to emphasize that we see that the, there are just amazing opportunities out there right now for attorneys because the market is expanding. It's just a matter of finding a way to practice in an efficient way and to be affordable to people who otherwise wouldn't even hire a lawyer. A recent survey that we commissioned showed that about 47% of small business owners had never talked to a, an attorney, never really sought legal counsel. And we all know every business has some type of legal issue. 
and two-thirds of our own users who contact an attorney through Rocket Lawyer On Call, which is our network of attorneys, have never spoken to an attorney before the conversation that uh, we, we connected them to. And so that's what we're trying to change and truly make the law affordable and accessible. Connecting attorneys to the small businesses who need them is a must, and that's what we're doing. So I know we do have a number of attorneys on the call, so I, I wanted to do a little bit of talking about our um, on-call network. There are several ways to work with Rocket Lawyer as an attorney, and the number one being the ability to meet new clients at no cost. It's important to know we have no financial relationship between our company and the on-call attorneys. But I feel, and this isn't true across the board, but in general, lawyers aren't marketers. That's not, it's not why we went to law school, and it's certainly true in my experience. So what we're trying to do is make it easy for attorneys and clients to get introduced, sort of like a match.com. We let you practice as you normally would with one particularly nice added perk. Each on-call attorney has a dedicated attorney services representative who can help them build out their online practice. We, they can help you improve your online profile, help you manage your client interactions to make sure that everyone's happy. A question we get a lot is, how do we make money if we aren't charging the attorneys to be a part of our network? And we say we have a freemium product. So the majority of our customers don't pay us, but a percentage do on a monthly basis and maybe an annual basis. We think that the attorney component makes our service offering better and stronger. So we don't ask attorneys to pay us, but rather pass on a cost savings with certain free and discounted services to the customers who do pay us. Another benefit we offer to attorneys is access to our extensive library of legal documents at no cost. Um, which is, again, since I'm head of legal operations, I'm working that on a daily basis, trying to not only improve the product, but expand that library. Um, we also have other online tools to make the attorney's interactions with Rocket Lawyer customers more efficient. Funny enough, we found that many attorneys join Rocket Lawyer as customers just to gain access to these documents, which we take as a very high compliment. There are a variety of other ways to work with us and gain more exposure, such as reviewing um, and becoming the face of key legal documents. We like to give our attorneys who do document reviews for us attribution on our landing pages. Um, you could write for our blog, participate at live events like Social the Lawyer. But I'd say the next big thing for Rocket Lawyer and the legal industry in general is mobile. For law, mobile in 2013 is, the same, is in the same state, I think, as the desktop legal market was when Rocket Lawyer started in 2008. Mobile is important, for example, like one of our customers, Gary, he's in San Jose. He uses his truck's dashboard as his office. Or as an attorney, I remember waiting in long lines at, you know, at the courthouse, and my email was piling up, and so was my work. And so that's who we built the business for, whether your office is a dashboard, a toolbox, a, a long line at the courthouse, all of these are small businesses and they need mobile. They need access to legal help everywhere. So we're proud to serve that market and we're excited for this industry. So uh, that's a little bit about Rocket Lawyer as a company. Look forward to answering any questions they, any, anyone may have um, listening. And Roger, I'll just hand it back over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Lisa. And, and thank you, uh, panelists. I. Um, you know, my, my practice is a large part of it startup. So <clears throat> the first question that ever comes to my mind is, is what's the problem that's, that you're trying to solve? And what's the market need and why now? And I, I think we got a really good sense of that. So let me just kind of cut right to the big question uh, that I think a lot of our audience has on their mind. And I'm going to put this to each of the panelists in, in the order that they present it. And it has to do with what this means for the legal industry. It seems to me that there is somewhat of a quiet revolution already uh, in our business just because of the, the internet boom over the last 10 years. And we've seen lots and lots of boutiques and smaller firms doing more sophisticated work, forming relationships. Uh, I certainly could not have started my firm as a tax lawyer uh, without uh, good technology linking me to other lawyers and complementary disciplines. And it looks like we're about to hit another revolution. So uh, again, the question I'd like to put to you is, is what can we expect? What does this mean for the legal industry? How is it going to change? Renee, do you have a, do you have a view? Um, sure. Well, so I guess from my perspective and, and by way of a little bit of additional background, 
I came to uh, my energies for the reInvent Law Lab as a scholar of the legal profession, and in particular the way the legal profession is regulated, and my frustration um, with regulations that I think stifle innovation for lawyers. And so one thing that I see happening, notwithstanding the uh, resistance by the American Bar Association, for example, to liberalize lawyer regulation, that we are seeing, um, much as these examples have shown us, that the, the clients, the customers at, at all ranges are, are demanding this innovation, and so we're having to make it happen uh, and figuring out how to do that under existing regulatory structure. So for the future, I, I used to say I hope, and now I actually see it happening. Um, people who need lawyers are going to be able to access legal services in a way that is affordable and a part of their daily life. And this is a problem that has confounded our profession for over a century in that we have failed to deliver legal services to most of this country unless you qualify for specialized legal aid or can afford an attorney at three figures an hour for multiple hours. You aren't accessing the legal services you need. And so um, at a time where we see lots of headlines uh, about unemployed or underemployed lawyers, I actually have a, a huge amount of uh, enthusiasm and, and see uh, a world wide open for those lawyers to think about using the tools that, we're, that many of the experts you've just heard from today in this webinar are out there developing and creating to make uh, legal services more accessible, more affordable, and oh, by the way, for the lawyer practicing law, perhaps a, a more livable lifestyle, and, and that to me is very exciting. Okay, thanks very much. Richard, uh, do you have a, a view that you'd like to express on this? Yeah, I have, I have a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> the, the first one is, uh, excuse me, that uh, I see large law firms also becoming more virtual and, ho and hollowing out just like smaller firms in order to become more competitive and more productive. Uh, Richard Susskind has famously said at one point that, that in the future lawyers will either be litigators or software engineers. So legal software engineers. I actually don't believe that because I believe that actually clients still need lawyers as trusted advisors and people to advise them. Um, but uh, like Renee, I see a huge untapped latent market that solos and small firms can connect with. And uh, cost is actually becoming less of a problem because of the oversupply of lawyers. You can get an uncontested divorce for $500. And, you get a will for $100, and LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer are putting price pressure on, uh, on, on, on documents and on services. So the, the real, one of the issues that I've been thinking about lately is this issue of engagement. And uh, the problem is that the broad population don't, don't really have a clear idea when they should be using a lawyer or how a lawyer can solve their problem. And uh, there's an issue of engagement, uh, both on, on the web and off the web, that people don't necessarily think of a lawyer as someone who can uh, prevent them from having larger problems later. And uh, so it's in part a marketing problem and in part a, a software problem. So some of the things that we've been thinking about are ways of engaging clients more effectively on the websites that we run through things like games, quizzes, interactive tools, um, which are more fun to use and which somehow connect clients with uh, the lawyers that they need. So I think uh, in order to really tap into this large, huge, uh, like we estimate a $44 billion latent market for legal services, we have to address both delivery systems and ways in which uh, clients can engage them. Um, that's for me. Go ahead. Okay. I'll pass Thank you, the Richard. next panelist. Uh, great. Thanks. So Raj, Abiyankar, what does the future hold for law firms? What's the law firm of the future going to look like? Yeah, so I, I mostly say how the perception of lawyers is going to change. I think the general uh, public's perception of lawyers is a shark. Um, you, know, you, you look at like uh, even movies, cultural things, uh, lawyers the one that get eaten first in Jurassic Park. And I think, you know, the, the thing is, you know, the perception of lawyers, I believe, and should and will change to another type of animal who, who's, I want to characterize it, it, you know, who's loyal, faithful, true. I'm reading something, but I'm trying to just paraphrase it. The basic ideals of this animal is guarding against the wrong societies as a whole, as a whole and who stays with them 
uh, can be relied upon to speak up for the disenfranchised and the downtrodden is not showy and is sometimes shy at social gatherings, be good listeners and make good companions um, and uh, can sometimes bark and bite and but they have a highly sense of, of honor and duty. Um, and this, this animal is a dog. So I don't know, I think the future uh, people may see lawyers as loyal companions in their journey across life as opposed to people who want to bite them and, and, and hurt them. And I think that um, perception change, um, to make that happen, law firms will benefit because they'll not only get more legal work, but they'll have more pride in their professions. Um, the suicide rates will hopefully come down and, and the disenfranchised lawyers uh, will find value in legal education. So I think um, you know, part of the challenge for lawyers is to change a perception of who we are. So we are seen um, more like the, the loyal companions across the stages of life that require us than those that are scary and uh, you know in our own in our own kind of um, uh, jaded world. Okay, th thanks, Raj. Appreciate that, Bo. I know you've got a view as to how, um, especially your product, is going to change uh, practice of law and what law firms will look like going forward. Well, um, thank you. I certainly do. I, I I certainly echo everything that the prior speakers have said. Um, you know, I like to think of it as an issue of career development. And someone who's in a job um, constantly needs to figure out ways to reinvent himself or reinvent herself. And it's all about how do you rise? It's, it's, you've got to rise up the value chain. And so you have to be doing higher level, higher value added functions. Because the lower level functions, they, they get commoditized or they get automated or they get, they get replaced. And so I think the legal industry needs to, to do that as an industry, really, and say, well, how, do we, how do we rise up the value chain? Because we're getting, there's a lot of pressure here from technology. Uh, the mundane, the routine tasks, you know, we cannot charge our rates to go and do those things anymore. Clients won't pay for it. Um, you know, I know from anecdotal evidence that big companies, that are hiring law firms sometimes will say, we're not going to pay for your first year associates. We're not going to pay for your second year associates because they're not performing value, value added tasks for us. You know, we're paying to train them and we don't want to do that anymore. So I think the lawyers need to embrace technology so that they can move up the value chain in their services, uh, re replace or automate the mundane tasks um, and uh, you know the the thing that that I ended with when I was describing venture docs, which is, you know, the the ultimate value add of the lawyer, I think, is is experience and judgment and advice, and and that is, by the way, that's the fun part of the practice. So, and problem solving, that's the fun part of the practice, and I think lawyers need to to, you know, strive to to focus on that as their primary value add, and people will pay for that. People will pay a lot for that because it's worth a lot. Okay, thank you, Bo. Lisa, I think you get the last word on this question. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I, you know, I think everyone's made some really good points, um, and sort of how I ended my introduction was as, as sort of a snippet into what I will say here that I think mobile is where where things are going. Mobile gives access to the law wherever you are. And I think that's what people are looking for. And um, you know, I liked what one of the speakers said is that they try to get their attorneys to respond within a few minutes if possible. And that's what mobile will allow you to do um, is kind of get that information to your clients as soon as you can. And I love to see that lawyers are embracing that and they're doing what online banking and electronic medical records and you know the other industries are doing. Lawyers are doing it too. And I think that's really great. And I think also what we'll see is just a little bit more transparency. Uh, if you get connected to an attorney through Rocket Lawyer, you go to their profile, you'll see how much it costs, which I found a lot of small businesses, that's one of their biggest reasons for not talking to an attorney is they're just worried about these crazy billable rates and how long will it take. And now our customers can do part of the work themselves through creating the documents and then work with an attorney for the part that they just need a little bit more counseling on. And so that's where I see the practice going. And I, you know, it really at the end of the day, I think it's good for both attorneys and clients.
So again, Roger, I did just want to thank you for inviting Rocket Lord to be a part of this. I enjoyed, enjoyed the webinar quite a bit. Great, thank you. So we're coming up on the top of the hour, and as promised, we're going to end on time. I could talk about this topic all day long and ask questions. Uh, I'd like to, to thank our panelists for being here and to thank those of you in the audience for listening and submitting questions. There have been several questions uh, that people have asked about getting further information, following up, contacting the panelists. Uh, and I want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded. You will find it in three places, on RoyceUniversity.com, uh, on our YouTube channel, and also as a pod podcast for download in the iTunes store. Or you can certainly just email me or any of the panelists for further information. Again, I want to thank you folks. And with that, we are concluding the webinar.